We are live. Hello, everyone, and happy Halloween. We are live. What? Happy Halloween. Today Halloween? is it's Halloween. It's Halloween. Yes, it is. <laughs> Today is, <laughs> and, and you're you're looking in the spirit there, John. Today's Friday, October, <laughs> October 31st. We're in a Halloween season. This is episode seven of our Google Hangouts and podcasts on all things Doxis. I'm Brady Volp, founder of the Volp Firm, Nimble This. With me is John Downey, a Halloween expert and consulting engineer of Cisco Systems. John, I'm I'm glad that you're in your uh, your Halloween spirit there, looking good. My garb. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but looking good. But so what's the costume? What I, uh, I just woke up from my red eye flight back from San Jose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I don't think I've ever seen you with hair. <laughs> at least, at least on my head. <laughs> my yeah. face is and the only bad. thing that I could come up with is is to try to go in solidarity with your headphones set up there. So I <laughs> headphones match yours. Uh, what's your vector, Victor? <laughs> yeah, clearance, Clarence. <Clarence. laughs> Roger, Roger. <laughs> okay. So um, yeah, so so uh, today we're going to do some. Uh, we we've had a lot of questions coming in from our listeners, and uh, we're going to cover some of those. Um, I'd like to give a, a shout out to Stephen Jay in Madison, Wisconsin. Stephen writes, "I've been enjoying your discussions with John and get your tech on, and with a telco that has been purchasing cable companies throughout the U.S. and it appears to be a continuing thing. I haven't even touched the CMTS yet." I just see there's a mix of Eris and Cisco CMTSs in the different locations. So I appreciate listening to your discussions on the podcast to give me a heads up on what is stewing in the Doxis world as I'm swimming with the sharks while feeding them chum. So thanks for listening, Stephen, and keep the comments and questions coming. So, John, our first question comes from Bobby, and he's asking, what formula should one use to determine the power spectral density difference or correction factor between two channels with different QAM modulation. Let's say one is 3.2 megahertz wide, 16 QAM signal, and the other is a 6.4 megahertz wide, 32 QAM signal. So I really like this question because I mean this is one of the things we cover so often in training when we have like a you know different signals of different bandwidths in the upstream, different DOCSIS channels. One's 3.2 megahertz wide and one's 6.4 megahertz wide. And a lot of times we say, well, you know, there's a 3 dB power difference between these two if you, if you measure the power spectral density. And, and the common rule of thumb is the way you calculate that is you take 10 log of 3.2 megahertz divided by 6.4 megahertz, and, and that gives you 3.01 dB or 3.01 dB. And so normally you would you would see that power difference my, 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 that gives you the power spectral density difference, right? Yes, yes, definitely. It's an interesting question because um, there's some misconceptions, I guess, against channel width and modulation. For instance, uh, according to the spec, DOCSIS, the modem's max transmit is dictated by the modulation. It's max transmit. What it can put out is dictated by modulation. Uh, and even though we run mixed type of mob profile, we're really talking about the data burst, even though the power level is dictated by the station maintenance burst. So a lot of times your station maintenance burst could be 16 qualm, but you're running 64 qualm for the data. Well, the worst case scenario is the 64 qualm. So the modem's max transmit might be 54 dBmV if it's DOCSIS 2.0 when doing 64 qualm. Now, the power level reading from the CMTS is dictated by the channel width, which right. is kind of and, interesting. And so, so it's always been my understanding that if, you know, so if, if I originally have my cable modem set up at 3.2 megahertz wide, you know, they'll, they'll be at a certain transmit power. And then if I increase that transmit power or the, that bandwidth of the cable modems to 6.4 megahertz, the CMTS is going to automatically reduce the power of those cable modems by 3 dB because we're, we're trying to reduce the power so we don't have laser clipping problems. But I, I think you're telling me that's not always the case, correct? So, so actually you would think it would be opposite, opposite. If we wanted to keep power spectral density, power per hertz, the CMTS to tell the modem to increase by 3 dB to keep the same power per hertz because you're doubling the hertz, right? 
if it hurts, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but Cisco, from the very beginning, made a conscious decision to say, if the customers change channel with in the future, we don't want the modems to change their power level. Well, their power level is digital average power. So what we the customers from 3.2, 6.4, keep the same modem transmit power, but by doing that, you're spreading the channel over spectrum, which makes it appear 3 dB lower on a, a spectrum analyzer. It's the same power under the curve. You're just taking it and squishing it down to spread it out. So on a spectrum analyzer, it will definitely look 3 dB lower than a 3.2 megahertz wide channel, but the power level is still the same. So sure. in regards, it's, it's you've kept the same average power, the same modem transmit power, but you just took a 3 dB hit in CNR. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's, that's one of the noise. challenges with going to the 6.4 megahertz bandwidth. You, you, you're, typically, your MER goes actually worse than 3 dB. Your MER gets worse than 3 dB, which is you know, one of the things we always scratch our head. Well, the, the power dropped by 3 dB, why does MER get worse? Or over a wider bandwidth, so there's more effects, more impairments that we can see over that wider bandwidth you know, because if we have a modem that's only 3.2 megahertz wide, it's going to see impairments over a 3.2 megahertz bandwidth. When we go to a 6.4 megahertz bandwidth, not only are we 3 dB lower, which is going to reduce our, our CNR by 3 dB, so now our MER should get 3 dB worse, but we, we're going to see more impairments over that 6.4 dB bandwidth. We know, we know MER is like CNR under additive white Gaussian noise. <laughs> but in a cable plant, we know we don't just have additive white Gaussian noise. <laughs> we have linear, uh, nonlinear parents. We have uh, common path distortion. We have roll off. We have in channel standing waves. This is where pre EQ comes in, right? We've been harping about the benefits of pre EQ, you know, right. the equalizer coefficient. So, yes, I'll take a 3 dB hit, but then I turn on pre EQ and maybe it gets a little bit, maybe back to, instead of losing 5 dB of MER, maybe I only lose 2 maybe actually picked up a dB from the 3.2 megahertz that wasn't doing pre-EQ. Um, you know, it's, so it's interesting is when we go to double channel width, we might take a hit on our MER. When we change our modulation, we might take a hit on our modem transmit power. So yeah, both of those decisions have to be taken into account. Sure. This is another reason why I have some systems that are looking at doing a quarantine channel of maybe even 1.6. By the way, you know, remember the old channel widths, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.8? Those ones have been scrubbed for DOCSIS 3.0. Yeah, and, and, and the they, were, I mean, they were really... Was 1 th those were very commonly used when DOCSIS really started going because our upstreams were so noisy that those, were, those small bandwidths were very reliable. So we, we use them because they, they could punch through the noise. No one's using those small bandwidths anymore except yeah. maybe for set-top boxes because you, exactly. you were talking about 1.6 megahertz. Set-top boxes need those to, because they're so far, they're, they're really deep in, in houses, so that's something that can punch through the noise. It can, it can also transmit at higher powers. So, so that's the, the, the key thing is if I want so I put it almost anywhere in the spectrum. When you have a narrow carrier, you have less group delay because it's not wide. So you might even be able to put it near the roll-off, or you might say, let's put it below 15 megahertz. I know my noise floor usually is kind of like raised up a little bit at the low end, besides impulse noise, but it actual noise floor is raised up. But because it's 1.6 megahertz, it'll be 6 dB higher in CNR versus a 6.4 channel because it's four times smaller. So that's 6 dB. So I might be able to afford to do QPSK or 16 qualm at 1.6 in the lower band and just push my set-top boxes to that upstream channel. That way, if I go QPSK, I can have higher transmit power, which like you alluded to, modems that are in the set-top box for, say, box of set-top gateway, they can overcome that inherent loss in the house, the extra four-way, the extra cabling, uh, and all that. And I don't need speed from a test set-top box. You know, a set-top box is just doing control traffic and, you know, electronic program guide or EPG or whatever. Okay, good. So, 
just uh, you know, just to, to to close out the, I think the formula. Uh, if someone does want to get that correction factor, it's 10 log of of one frequency over the other. So 10 log of 3.2 megahertz divided by 6.4 megahertz. That's going to give you 3.01 dB. So it's a 3 dB difference. Um, our next question uh, is from Mark. Oh, says, wait, wait, wait. By the way. Know, you mentioned about the the noise in the channel be affecting the channel. Really, it's because it's digital front end now. It's the noise under the the symbol rate of the channel. So a 3.2 megahertz wide channel really is only 2.56 of actual bandwidth, and there's built-in guard bands built into the 3.2. Right. I just want to be specific. Like I could have ingress right on the very edge, and it might not affect my MER because it's not in the symbol rate of the channel. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, and I think we've covered that in other other podcasts before, where we talk about how close can you put the DOCSIS channels? Can you put them side by side? And and absolutely, you can. It, it is because of that adjacency, uh, the, the the root raise cosine filter that goes around the the DOCSIS channels. Yeah, so. I call it filter alpha or whatever it's called. Yeah. Um, so next question from Mark: Is there any way to force the CMTS to set a specific service group as the preferred service group? So I think that question stems from steering. How do I steer maybe business subscribers to a certain bonding group? Or how do I steer certain high, higher service tiers like a gold versus a bronze uh, that's paying for a higher uh, speed to maybe cleaner depth? Downstream or for streams that I know are not subscribed or something to that nature. And I think the answer to that would be DOCSIS load balancing. You know, DOCSIS load balancing, when it was uh, formulated or came up and specified, it was also used to steer modems. You know, back in the day, we used something called kib modem steering that looked at TLVs in the CM file. But now you're manipulating the CM file and you're doing some attributes on the CMTS so that when the modem comes up, it gets it gets uh, tagged with these attributes and placed where it's supposed to be. But it was also, um, what's the word for it? If it didn't match, the motor would never come online when you did attributes and CM steering. So it's either all or nothing, basically. Whereas DOCSIS restricted low balance groups I can put in a tag of modem capability, like modem 2.0, 3.0, uh, modem, uh, DOCSIS mode 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, I can put in um, modem capability of downstream channels. For instance, MRCS, multiple received channels. Like in the market today, we have four downstream by four upstream modems, eight by fours, 16 by fours, 24 by eight, and potentially a 32 by eight coming on the market. Those are the DOCSIS 3.0 bonding capability. We can, that information is, is sent back from the cable modem back to the CMTS without doing any manipulation of the CM file. So we can grab that and say, when that modem registers, tell me what its capability is. Oh, right, it's tagged as a 24 by 8. I'm going to force it to the downstream. Or that modem was tagged as an 8 by 4 modem. Uh, I know it has an MRCS capability of 8 channels. I wanted to use the first 8 downstream channels, not the last 16 downstream channels. Because maybe you're doing 24 downstream DOCSIS channels in your cable plan. So there are ways to intercept, sort of intercept. DOCSIS says, let the modem fully register, and then we'll do a DCC, dynamic channel change, to move the modem after it registers. So that's part of the DOCSIS load balancing and the steering. I let it register. I steer it to the frequencies it's supposed to go to. Then I allow it to load balance within those frequencies. Does that make sense? No, absolutely, yeah. and I, I think what you're talking about, especially like the, the DCC, is really important for, for operators to understand, and especially the people that are managing CMTS, is because sometimes I see uh, folks that will put something like in the config file, they'll put a, a frequency in, in the config file because they're trying to do this sort of in a manual way. So a cable modem will start registering with a CMTS, it'll get a config file telling it to go to a different CMTS because it, it, it reads that frequency, it basically tells the cable modem, well, you're on, you're on uh, a CMTS we don't want you to be on, and it gets that frequency, and so it has to deregister and manually go to a different CMTS. And, and so this, 
this causes a number of different issues. I mean, it, it, it takes longer for the cable modem to move around, and, and I think when you're talking about the dynamic channel change, it's such a, a more efficient way to move cable modems around the system to where you want them to do it. As you're saying, it's you're steering that cable modem, you're doing it dynamically, and uh, it's, it's, it's a much better way of doing it. And, and in Doxis, there's provisions there that says, for Doxis Load Balance, that you're supposed to follow the, the Doxis Load Balance, uh, but if you fail, I think it's like three or two to three or four times, you can ignore that Doxis Load Balance steering and come up wherever, wherever you can actually come up on. So it's kind of, um, is it good or bad? I don't know. I, I personally, I feel I'd rather the modem up somewhere eventually than not be online. But some people might say, well, I don't ever want that type of modem on these downstreams. So they might have to take different provisions besides just toxic load balancing. Because with toxic load balancing, maybe the frequencies are bad. So the toxic load balance says, move them over, doesn't work. Move it over, doesn't work. Move it over, doesn't work. Oh, you failed like three times, so I'm not going to make you abide by that toxic load balance rule. And when you come up on the other downstreams, I'll let you come up. Well, you bring up a good point because if you do a show cable modem load balance uh, statistics, uh, I mean, if you show, show load balance statistics, you see a lot of cable modems that are failing, uh, the dynamic channel change and stuff. For whatever reason, um, you know, maybe it's just a firmware issue in a cable modem. Maybe there are other problems with going on in a, in a physical RF plant. Do we need to be worried about those cable modems that are failing load balancing? What What are the best practices to do with yeah, that? Yeah, I mean... The, the DCC has four techni five techniques, technique zero through four. So that's five different techniques. But interestingly enough, technique three really is just really zero. Move the modem, make it re-register. Can, can you so repeat you that? The modem, you, had to re -register. you broke up a little bit there on what? what is technique three oh. again? Technique three allows the modem to use technique one or two. So really, three is not a new one. It's just giving the modem the option to use one or two. As you go through the techniques, it becomes um, less robust but more uh, efficient or faster, meaning technique four is the best to get layer three connectivity back up and running, meaning if I move a modem using technique four, I'm not going to do station maintenance. I'm not going to do initial maintenance. It's going to move over and try to do layer three traffic right away. But... If I move from one downstream to another downstream and the levels are different by more than like 60 dB or so, the modem is probably not going to survive a Technique 4. This is why I tell people when you do DOCSIS load balancing for 2.0 modems, you want all your frequencies contiguous. If you were to separate the frequencies too far in a real cable plant, it's going to be like this as far as levels go. You know, end of line modem, you know, um, because of just total. So if I try to move a modem from one downstream frequency to another downstream frequency, that's difference in level. Uh, by more than, say, 6 dB, it's probably not going to survive a Technique 4. Um, if my time offsets change by more than about 10, I, 10 offset ticks, uh, Technique 4 might not work. So I tell people if Technique 4 doesn't work, but it works with some modems, not others, it's probably firmware. You need to update the firmware in the modem. Uh, if it's not working anywhere, try Technique 3. I even had one modem that it's, it was one vendor that his firmware needed updated but why make everybody else suffer in the cable plant by doing Technique 3 across the board? Because Technique 3 says, let the modem pick Technique 1 or 2, which means either do station maintenance all over again uh, or do initial maintenance, but don't, you don't have to do the whole registration process. But you do have to do the maintenance. Check your levels, check your upstream frequency, check your uh, pre-EQ comes into play. So what I found is with Technique 3 and pre-EQ, even if I'm just changing downstream, and not moving upstream, those parameters still have to do the So it's taking like five or six seconds of layer three traffic down. So if I try to move a modem from 455 megahertz to 755 megahertz and the time offsets change a little bit too much, um, or if I do technique three, it has to do redo station maintenance, uh, you're going to lose like three, four, or five seconds of layer three traffic. But the modem stays online. We're right. going to lose layer three traffic. 
So, so with the res so Steve Williams is asking uh, with the restricted load balancing, is that is that an all or nothing scenario, or can it be targeted to uh, a specific device or specific devices? Uh, I mean, you can tag a modem based on service class name. Um, you could tag modems like DSG to say OUI, all DSG. OUI. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot of options for distinguishing which modems you want to move. Some of them are going to be more complex, meaning it might be a service class name that you have in the CM file. Some of them might be no CM file manipulation. It's just based on the modem's capability. But then again, what if you have a 2 modem doing business service and a 2 modem doing residential, and you just want to move the business service? Well, you can't tag based on capability because it's the same capability for both but you would tag on business service, and maybe there's some distinguishing feature in the CM file that you can lock onto. Right, okay. Like service class name, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think one thing we need to do is, is get you on a, on a business class modem for your, for your home network there, because... <laughs> <laughs> Breaking up? <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a lot of jitter, a lot of packet loss going on, but... Uh... <laughs> The the beauty of my landline is not working, and I'm on the wireless, so I don't know if that's probably the problem. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> possibly. So, okay, any anything else on the? Uh, that was a good, I think, a good overview on on uh, load balancing there and covering the the, the question. Uh, so did, for, did we for do the steering a hangout stuff. on load balance before? No, did we, we didn't. But I think that, I think that might make a a good uh, a, a good topic just to cover all, all that. There's a lot of detail in load balancing that we can cover. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, definitely a lot. I mean, because then you have modems that are going into partial mode. You have two O modems that are moving around. You have three O modems that are bonding across the channels and filling the channels up, maybe equally, maybe not equally. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that kind of butt heads when you're doing load balance. So we'll, we'll put that on our list. Um, uh, Lewis S. is asking, what's the number of homes passed required to achieve the promised speeds of DOCSIS 3.1? And, and I, I think, you know, this is, this is one of those um, ethereal questions that, that can kind of be uh, generalized to a lot of different DOCSIS. It's, uh, as Ron Rannick says, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my answer to, was it Louis S.? Is it Lewis or Louise? It's probably Louise. Uh, my answer to him is one. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on how much that, that the subscribers are going to use. <laughs> we can we can offer it to one customer <laughs> and, to, and 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 promise that speed. I mean, this I comes down to traffic engineering. One customer, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> this comes down to traffic engineering and uh, what are we willing to oversubscribe? Right? I mean, it's the same with Doxus 2.0. This is another reason why the rule of thumb has been lately to not offer a speed more than half of the aggregate possible. Meaning, if I have an eight channel capable modem, eight by four bonded modem, eight channels times, and I use 36 megabits per second for my usable rate for a downstream channel, 256 Qualm NXB. Uh, that's modular CMTS. I might be able to get a little bit more if it's uh, integrated CMTS. So if you take 36 times 8, you end up with um, 70 times 4, 3, 320. How much is that? 36 times 8, uh, 288. I just remember from doing actual tests. It's about 288 megabits per second. That's correct. So yes. <laughs> you should not try to offer more than 140, maybe 150 at the most as a service offering from an eight channel bonded modem. And if that's the case, two customers could be on at the same time and get the speeds that you're, you're advertising. But because you know that we oversubscribe, you might be able to oversubscribe that 25 to 1. So that's 50 customers all with 150 megabit per second service uh, sharing the, eight, the same eight downstream channels. Yeah, and and it's Luis, magic. No, it's magic. Luis is saying that that's what he expected. He's uh, he's on listening right now. So <laughs> and I, I hope we're pronouncing his name properly. If he can he can correct us otherwise. Um, so uh, we have a question up for Willie. He says I, I I'm having provisioning issues where the CM sometimes gets online, sometimes doesn't. It fails while in ranging. The log shows TCC. 
acquisition failed. TCS failed on all upstreams. Any idea what might be causing this? And and maybe TCS, we should yeah. to say what TCC stands for. Mm. So, so Tra transmit transmit channel, channel set. set yeah transmit yeah. And the other one was what transmit channel. Uh, I don't consider, I think it is. There's so many acronyms I keep forgetting yeah. myself. <laughs> Either way, it's based on DOCSIS 3.0 upstream bonding. The 3.0 upstream bonding modem has multiple upstream channels, right? So we call it MTC mode, multiple transmit channel set. Um, so the modem is doing multiple channels in the upstream. And I, I, I'm guessing that the modem is having problems with registration. It's usually going to be upstream noise upstream timing issues. Um, we already know it locked on the downstream, right, if it's doing upstream ranging. What about power level issues? So those three things are probably the biggest ones. It's one, is that modem, if I do a show cable modem MAC address for Bose, I can see what the tr transmit levels of the modem are. You know what's interesting about 3.0? According to the spec, when a 3.0 modem is in MTC mode in the upstream, doing upstream bonding, or trying to register and range and all that, it reports its transmit level back to the CMTS. So I don't need special SNMP. SNMP is not going to this next yet. So I can't query the modem to get its transmit levels. But with DOCSIS 3.0 mode, during registration, those levels are transmitted back to the CMTS. I can go on the CMTS and say, what is the power level this modem is transmitting? And I might be able to see, oh, well, it's transmitting at 55 dBmV, which might be okay for one channel, but I'm trying to do four-channel upstream bonding. So the CMTS is like, well, to do four-channel bonding, 64 qualm, the max output's 51. You're already at 55 for one channel, so you are obviously have too much attenuation between you and the CMTS to come back at me at zero, which is what I want to see. Uh, and it might just range and then eventually just time out and try again. So right. I don't know if it's a power level issue or where it could be a timing issue. So the timing issue is interesting because um, I had uh, a problem in the head end one time with a modem because the modem wasn't going through fiber optics. It was in the head end. It was a test modem. And can you hear me okay still? Yeah, yeah. We lost you. your picture for a little okay. while, but that'll that'll just make Steve Williams happy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was too aggressive with my time offsets, and I found if my map advance was less than about 2,300 on my map advance, my modems were going into upstream bonding partial mode. Like the timing wasn't; it was too aggressive on the timing. So, in a real cable plant, you your time offset. Are, are dictated by the fiber optic link, your downstream modulation, downstream interleaving, all these other settings affects my map advance. But in the head end, you have a short time offset because the modem's right there in the head end. There's no fiber optic distance. Um, so I was getting a little bit too aggressive and I had problems. Yeah. I mean, so, so I, I think the bottom line is, is, is when you see these TCS, TCC failed messages on the upstream, it's it's an upstream problem, and the you know this the the, the bonding portion when when the DOCSIS 3.0 modem is registering that bonding portion occurs at the very end the very tail end of the registration we've gone through DHCP we've downloaded the config file we've done a lot of important processes so this is probably this is an upstream issue that's where you should probably start looking is in the upstream one of your upstream channels is having problems and then that's where it's it's failing at. Or well, probably yes. most of the upstream channels is having problems. That, that that's I mean that is the interesting thing here is the modem's not registering, so it has to be having a lot of upstream problems. Uh, and the fact that it was able to get to this point even makes it more more complex. Yeah, I I would say that I would look at uh, show cable flap list. I would look at show cable hop for correctable, uncorrectable effect. Obviously, look at a spectrum analyzer just to make sure that the physical layer plant looks clean. Start troubleshooting at layer one first, which is physical layer. So break out the spectrum analyzer, make sure the noise is okay. But when I bring out the, the timing issue, that's one of those things that doesn't show up in the physical layer. 
I mean, it could be physical layer if you had a vector signal analyzer or something, but no one really has those. <laughs> Most people have a spectrum analyzer looking at frequency versus amplitude. So I look for noise. I, I slow down the sweep speed of a spectrum analyzer. I look for impulse noise. Uh, I look at the modems that are online to see if they're registering misses in the flap list, maybe T3 or T4 timeouts, stuff like that. Uh, look at a correctable and uncorrectable effect. Uh, so if it's not physical layer, but it could be timing, which really is physical layer, there, but maybe you don't see that. Um, maybe there should be some, maybe it's a firmware issue with that modem too, right? I mean, there's there's a lot of different variables we have going on. Yep. Okay, so the um, final question comes from John. Uh, they're doing a uh, RFOG system, and they have problems with cable modems registering on the RFOG network. They believe that the initial station maintenance is occurring too quickly. So the you know the range requests are happening very fast. The the lasers are not able in the RFOG devices to turn on quickly enough, and so they want to know: Is there any way to uh, have the CMTS slow down or have the cable modem slow down their initial station maintenance uh, for the RFOG system? So so there I have some recommendations for RFOG, and one of them is a manipulated mod profile. The reason why I manipulate it is we found with our own testing with RFOG that it wasn't the turn-on time of the laser, it was the turn-off time. So the, the lasers would turn off, but then maybe the next house over, its laser would turn on, and there'd be slight overlap between the turn-off of one laser and the turn-on of another. The fastest, quickest burst you will have on the upstream from a modem is a not the initial uh, ranging. It would actually be a bandwidth request because it's only a six-byte doxis header uh, with some overhead, preamble, guard time. It might be one or two mini slots. So I've recommended to slow down my bandwidth request. If the bandwidth request is a contention request, it's not piggybacked. Uh, I manipulated it to be QPSK. I, it's very robust, but it's also longer in time. So if you look at a spectrum analyzer in a time domain, that bandwidth request might be like this when it's 16 qualm, but if I make it QPSK, it takes up this much time at QPSK. So it's taking longer in time. So just like you said, slowing it down, that's one way to do it. Run a lower modulation right. scheme. And, and usually they're infrequent enough to not really take a big chunk of your throughput. I mean, you are eating time on the wire, but it's infrequent. Initial maintenance, we could do the same thing. We could run that at QPSK. Um, initial maintenance is when the modem state is in it R1. So when the modem is ranging like 60B, 90B, 12DB, trying to range. Uh, so it's ranging and ranging, trying to get to the CMTS at zero dB and B. Um, if so, to slow that down, I, I mean, my recommendation would be the mod profiles I've been recommending with longer preamble, potentially longer guard time, uh, and different modulation depending on the burst type. If it's an initial maintenance burst, station maintenance burst, request burst, then I get into my data, my advanced short, advanced long, advanced UGS bursts. They might be running 64 qualm. Yeah, so I mean, so the bottom line here, this is not a you know just like a one button, one click solution or one command solution in the CMTS. Yeah. You're going to have to do some engineering in the CMTS and the modulation profiles yeah. and some other techniques to get this optimized and working for uh, for, for an RFOG system. That's that's the bottom line, right? Yeah, yeah. There's there's like five or six different little tweaks, best practices at this point. To, to make it work properly because we are allowing multiple lasers to come back and if they come back at the same time, same wavelength, then we have optical bead interference, OBI. And that's what we're trying to avoid. You know, I even had a, a customer one time that had one modem stuck in a NIT R1 eating up all the initial maintenance contention time for other modems. And what happened is I'd have 200 modems, 150 would come online real quick, one modem would get stuck in a NIT R1 and 40 or so more modems would just kind of hang out because there was no time to do initial maintenance because the modems that were online started running traffic. So now your bandwidth or your throughput, you might allocate initial maintenance a real small time slot uh, out of a second. But as you start running more traffic, you start saying, I need more time in that second for traffic. So that initial maintenance might shrink down to a small amount of time. So now you have less opportunities for modems to actually range and come online. And if one modem eats up all that time, then it kind of screws up everybody else. Sure. We physically had to find that modem, pull it off the line, and then all the other modems came online. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, a good, it's a good thing 
keep an eye on and knit our one. So um, that's that's all the questions we have. Um, we're going to cover right now from people who have written in. We have uh, two two people that have questions on our on our on our uh, board that have posted up, and uh, it's one is from. Uh, I fear I, I'm going to butcher the name, so I, I apologize in advance. I, I believe it's Matus, and then also uh, Chris uh, Van Bladel. That we're we're going to answer those two questions, and and then not accept any more, just to. Uh, uh, wrap up this this uh, hangout, and uh, I'll start first with Machus. And I, I'm I'm a little confused on on the question here, but I'm going to try to to summarize the question the best that I can, and uh, we'll 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 talk about this question. So it starts out. Uh, it looks like they're they're having problems with modems on a Doxis 3.0 system, where um, the the modems. Uh, they're having some uh, like a utilization issue. They're seeing 40% utilization when they pull out. When they reset the modem cards, the upstream utilization drops down to 7%. Um, the speed of the modems for the clients—they have a 40 megabit downstream and a 4 megabit per second upstream. And uh, on these cards, there there's four cards in the upstream, and that the 120 subscribers are using on that. So John, I, you know, so I think the question is are are we seeing have you seen something like that where resetting a card in the CMTS um, and, and Matus, if, if I've sort of missed something here, you know, please uh, send that back in, but John, have you seen something where resetting a card in the CMTS uh, could cause upstream utilization to have a dramatic decrease from 40% to 7%? Is that is that something that is a, a hardware failure in the card, or you know, could cause some change in traffic utilization? So, so, and you know, I just blur stuff out. So, to be the, my smart ass answer <laughs> would be, you reset the card, the motors went offline. <laughs> Answer solved. Yeah, so the is going to go way down. <laughs> yeah, well, if you disconnect no the point. coax cable, we also have uh, traffic go way down too. <laughs> if we didn't have customers, these networks would run great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm sure people really appreciate our help sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> we got to keep it light, right? Uh, so, you know, there are probably two or three things that came to my mind as you were telling me this this topic, and it could go either direction. One, we Cisco had a, a Cisco proprietary feature at one time called Rate Adapt, and the modems were getting more mini slots than what they asked for, so they could get better per modem upstream speed. Make sure you're not using Rate Adapt. What happened is the CMTS would schedule the mini slots, hence it would report the utilization because it scheduled it. But sometimes the modems wouldn't use those scheduled mini slots, so a modem could be doing four megabits per second, but it was scheduled for enough mini. It's for eight. So now it's utilized even though it's only doing four meg. Do you understand? So yeah. that was one that was one thing that would give the misrepresentation of actual speed to what the utilization was reporting. The other one could be what if they have stale service flows? A stale service flow is uh, someone goes off hook and does a voice call, and then when they hang up, that service flow doesn't get torn down at the CMTS. So so, we so call them stale service flows. If if that's a possibility, would resetting because Machus has come back and, and reset the card, you clear them all out. Not not the card, but he's he's saying that they they didn't actually reset the card, but they reset one cable modem, and that is what caused the the utilization to drop. So I, I was unclear. It, it was not the the CMTS card, but just one modem, and resetting one modem caused the utilization to dramatically drop. And they couldn't correlate the speed of that modem with that percentage of utilization. Meaning, like that modem was only supposed to do four megabits per second, and that wouldn't have correlated. Well, they're 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 they were forty megabits per second down, and I, I forget what their speed was in the upstream, but um, it's been four, it's been forty by four, so forty by four, and, and yeah, four meg. As soon, yeah, as soon as sixty four qualm, six point four megahertz, that channel. One channel is worth 27 megs, so four out of 27 is uh, one seventh. One seventh percentage-wise is only what 10 per or 15 percent, maybe. Yeah. So for for the utilization, the port report really high, just for four megabits per second. 
and especially was it upstream bonding? Was the modem doing upstream bonding or is it single channel? Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's a complex uh, a complex yes, problem. So uh, maybe maybe you know for next time, choose if if you want to write in a more detailed uh, uh, email to one of us or uh, uh, put it on on the Volt Firm uh, uh, Hangout site, we can maybe an analyze that and and get back to you. Uh, next, uh, the final question we're going to take. Wait, 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 wait. Add one more to that. What about the old babbling set top box? You could have a babbling modem, right? Just ch chopping out the modem so, so something, or the 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 CPE device behind it with uh, babbling but again, out. Uh, but then again, if it was babbling, yeah. But if it was babbling, it'd be more of a physical layer problem, and it wouldn't report from the CMTS. Yeah. So the utilization wouldn't really report. You would just see it like always on. Yeah. Um, so from from Chris, uh, we have what can cause a very short cable modem dereg deregistration ran uh, random over HFC network. Very say it again. Very short. Short say cable. Say it again. So it's um very short cable modem deregs random over the HFC network. So I think what he's saying here is um. It, uh, like short modems. Modems going offline. Yeah. Like deregistration. Deregistration. So they're the random. It's randomly occurring over the HFC network. Uh, so a very short cable modem deregs random over the HFC network. I don't know if you're seeing the questions that I'm I'm posting up there or not. Uh, no, uh, I'm not even sure. Oh, there it is. Yeah, um, short, almost like sporadic, r random deregistration of modems, like going online, offline. Um, downstream sync, the uh, modular CMTS architecture, the DTI server. You know, you have a Symmetricon DTI server. Uh, we are relying on that DTI server to provide us downstream sync. Uh, upstream problems, but I mean, if it's upstream problems, I should be able to go to the flap list and see misses, a lot of misses versus hits in the flap list. Uh, power adjustments. I mean, for modem yeah, to be okay. you know, and, and he's, actually dropping offline, he's giving us some more he's, information. He's added here uh, many many modems deregister random over the network. So. And I, I think this is also like a, there, there's a lot of information we need to to answer this question. Yeah, and if it's if it's random, I mean the thing with upstream, everything is noise funneling. So if it's an upstream problem, it would affect a lot of modems in that upstream or that using that frequency. But if it's random on the downstream, downstream is kind of broadcast out everywhere. Uh, what if it's LTE? You know, what if it's 4G cell phone? You know, what if they're using a downstream frequency that's in between 700 and 800 megahertz for DOCSIS and people in their house have their cell phones next to the modem and it's knocking out certain frequencies yeah. on the downstream? Could be a lot of different issues. So yeah. <laughs> this is definitely one to, to uh, take offline, get a little bit more information on and, and perhaps discuss yeah. next time. Yeah. So. yeah. All right, John. I think we've managed to kill yet another 80 megabytes of... Uh, uh, video data and, 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 and geek talk on Doxis. So, once again, thank you for your time, all our listeners. Thank you for checking in and and watching us. And uh, for for those of you in the U.S., ha happy Halloween. For those of you outside, well, happy Halloween to you also. So, <laughs> bye all. Have so a great maybe, weekend. John, maybe next one we do load balance. Sounds maybe good. next one we do a load balance. All right. That'll be our topic. Load balancing for next time. All right, talk good. All right.